Hi, good evening, everyone. I am McKenna Jordan. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. And I'm very excited tonight um, to be presenting another one of our virtual events. Tonight, we have David Class joined by another David, David Baldacci. They're gonna be doing a, a chat and I will come on in a little bit um, to moderate questions. So don't be shy. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can put those questions in the live chat. If you're um, watching on Facebook, you can just put them in the comments and I'll get to them in a little bit. Um, we have done a lot of virtual events um, since COVID started. And um, one of the things uh, that we get asked is, how do we do them? How do we get them set up? Um, so next Wednesday, we have kind of a special event, an authorless event, but it's going to be me, um, our event coordinator at Murder by the Book, John McDougall, who you've seen many, many times on here as well as a um, surprise guest um, who is going to be joining our team doing more uh, events. Um, her name is Sarah and the three of us will be talking about virtual events, um, that new partnership and some pretty cool things coming forward. So mark your calendars for next Wednesday um, for that event. We're pretty excited about it. Um, with regards to all of our other normal author events, um, you can find them all at murderbooks.com for the complete listing. And we're here very often on Facebook and YouTube with some pretty cool authors. So make sure to check that out. Okay, so tonight we are featuring David Class. I'm gonna bring him on here. Good evening, David. Good evening, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure, thanks for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and get you introduced here formally. David Class is the author of many critically acclaimed young adult novels and has also written more than 40 feature screenplays for Hollywood studios, including Desperate Measures, Kiss the Girls, Walking Tall, and In the Time of Butterflies. He has also written for Law and Order, Criminal Intent, and currently runs the TV writing concentration at the film program of Columbia University's Graduate School of the Arts. He's here tonight to talk about his brand new uh, paperback release, out of time and i should i should add that um i have dropped a link in our comments as usual and in the live chat um if you're wanting more information about either author's books or you'd like to order um the link is right there okay we are also joined by david baldacci good evening hello thanks for being here um I will also get you introduced. So David Baldacci is a global number one best-selling author and one of the world's favorite storytellers. His books are published in over 45 languages and in more than 80 countries with 150 million copies sold worldwide. His works have been adapted for both feature film and television. David Baldacci is also the co-founder along with his wife of the Wish You Well Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting literacy efforts across America. His most recent book is A Gambling Man. And again, more information about that can be found at the link um, in the comments. Okay, I'm gonna leave you two to chat. I'm gonna come back in um, in about 35 or 40 minutes. If you're ready for me to come in with questions, just say, I wonder if McKenna has some questions. And um, for those of you watching, there's no such thing as a dumb question, or if it really is a dumb question, I'll just ignore it. So put your questions in the comments and the chat. And I will see you guys back in a little bit. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, David. Um, I've been really looking forward to this. Um, I know we had a chat yesterday, but let's just jump into it. I mean, out of, out of time, this is it. I, I, when we talked about it before, I told you it was a Columbia book and a Columbia book. Um, so I'd like to know, can you tell us about how you conceived it, how you decided to structure it, um, and how you came up with the character for the good man? Um, sure. Well, first of all, you know, let me just thank uh, Murder by the Book for doing this. And uh, let me thank you, David. It's it's really an honor. Uh, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Let me just say that in 1996, I had an apartment in Los Angeles with a balcony. And I used to buy uh, a book every week and read it out on my balcony. And in 1996, I bought a new thriller by an unknown thriller writer named David Baldacci. And I, I thought that I would just read the first chapter or two. And uh, I ended up uh, sitting there half the night gripped by a master storyteller. So uh, it's really an honor to do this, but you also owe me an, uh, a night's sleep. <laughs> uh, I, I played guilty to that. <laughs> um, I think that you asked me uh, where uh, the character of Green Man really came from. And, and I appreciate the question. 
because I think the book really hangs on the character of Green Man, um, and that he's not a monster, that he's complex, and that he has a complex motivation. And when I was coming up with this character, uh, very much in my mind were the two most famous serial bombers in American criminal history, or two most notorious ones, at least. Um, one of them was the Mad Bomber, who exploded bombs in the New York area in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, his name was George Metesky. And the second one was the Unabomber, who I think everyone listening here probably knows about. And when the two of them were eventually caught after long manhunts, um, their profiles, if I may, uh, who they turned out to be uh, were very similar. Uh, they were both loners. Um, George Metesky was living with his two unmarried sisters in a house in Connecticut. And the Unabomber, when he was arrested, was in a cabin in Montana. Uh, neither of them were married. Neither of them had families. Uh, neither of them had any friends. And they were doing what they were doing. Uh, their motivation was really uh, vengeance uh, and bitterness and empowerment. And that sort of was the FBI playbook for serial bombers. And when I was trying to come up with this book and to come up with the central character of Green Man, I wanted to flip that. Uh, I wanted to flip that stereotype and try to create a character um, who was not a sociopath, but was in fact very empathic, who was not a loner, but in fact had a lovely wife and two great kids who he loved, uh, who lived in a quintessential American small town um, and people knew him and he had friends. And most importantly, this led to his motivation, which was not vengeance, uh, not bitterness, but uh, he was a scientist and he had read a lot of the science about how dangerous climate change is. And he believed that we were near a tipping point, that if we were gonna save the earth and pass it on to the next generation, we have to act right now. And given his skill set, given what he was able to do, he felt that he had to be the one to warn the world. So in a weird way, what he was doing, he was doing out of a sense of, of obligation, very reluctantly. Uh, and, and that was really interesting to me. And if I can just take this, you know, one step further, it raises the question and the book deals with the question of what if he was right? Uh, what if the, the FBI agent who's chasing him wonders if I catch this guy, am I depriving the world of its only chance? And, and that's a very dark and edgy question. And I have been criticized by readers and uh, even some dear friends who read the book who said, aren't you justifying terrorism? So I, I, I'd love to start off today by saying in this public forum, you know, I think terrorism is never justified. I think it's absolutely reprehensible. Uh, and I lost a dear friend in 9-11, you know, and, and killing innocent people is never, never justified. But I think that what books can do, uh, like Lord of the Flies or Crime and Punishment, is they can explore complicated moral questions. And, and that's what I was trying to do with Out of Time. And I, I wonder, David, where you fall out on this. I know you've written a lot of books and... Uh, I know that sometimes they involve violent characters, even in this wonderful book, A Gambling Man, which I absolutely loved, and by the way, would make a wonderful Father's Day present. Um, <laughs> but I'm even, even in this book, um, the main character, Archer, the main female character, Liberty Callahan, they sometimes do things, violent things, that we wouldn't normally do. Do you ever worry that your morality will be called into question because of what your characters do? I, I, the fact the that you got emails from people and you had people who were upset, you did your job as a writer. I mean, a book that doesn't provoke any type of emotion from anyone um, is probably not a very good book. Um, that's what our job is supposed to be. It's supposed to inspire dialogue. It's supposed to inspire emotion. It's supposed to inspire, you know, criticism. Um, for me, you know, I'll... I'll in, in your book, you put a lot of things on its head. 
you took a, a, a cereal bottle and made them very different from any other cereal bottle out there. You had an FBI agent and another traditional FBI agent. Um, and, and you sort of put the FBI's filing system on its head as well. I, I think that if we do the climate change, look, look I'm a fervent believer in climate change. I know I've, I'm in, in that for a number of people trying to combat climate change. Um, I think that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, if 100 million people perish because of climate change, um, what was the price worth? Um, that, you know, in your book, you think you know, a number of people killed by the, by the green line, but 100 million people could go for the next 30 years to the climate change. And whose who's fault is that? And whose morality is that? Um, so you really have to do it. I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, can I uh, can I now uh, take a second and uh, ask you a question about a gambling man? Yeah, um, I know we're getting we're getting some feedback here. I don't know where it's coming from, but um, a gambling man for me, um, I love crime and war. You know, I started off uh, with Dashiell Hammett. I worked my way through Raymond Chandler. Then I read everything by Ross McDonald. Um, and I was in Toronto a few years ago on book tour. It was the middle of a snowstorm. I had finished all my stuff for the day. I went back to home hotel room. I don't really sleep well on the road. So I'm staring out of this blizzard. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to write a short story with a guy named Aloysius Archer set in the 1940s. And he's going to try to become a gumshoe. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was going to be like a 40 or 50 page short story. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. You know, you know we have the same age in Aaron Priest. I was probably going to send it up to Aaron and said, what, what can I do with this? Um, but within a few months, I had a 400-page novel because I was so into that time period. And the 40s was, it was a period of transition for the U.S. You know, the Depression was over. The World War was over. People were sick and tired of fighting. They were sick and tired of being poor. They were just sick and tired of life. And they wanted something new. And a lot of them pulled up their roots and moved somewhere else. And a lot of them moved west. And that's what Archer did in, in, the, in the first novel, One Good Deed. He moved west. He wanted a better life. He'd just gotten out of prison. Um, and I wanted to try to understand that transition period a little bit better. My father was a World War II vet, um, and he went through that, some of that same stuff during his life. And it was like this golden period of anything was possible in this country, uh, which was sort of a great feeling. Nothing was beyond you know, the capability of, of America, of this country to do. But at the same time, uh, particularly if you're heading to like West to California and all that, there was an enormous enormous amount of wealth being created out there through a lot of different industries, including the film industry. And whenever you have wealth, you have that other thing, crime. And crime just follows the money. You know, it's like, uh, you know, the, 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 the bank robber, they asked him, how come uh, you keep robbing banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. And that's what, the, you know, that's what the forties were, but particularly in California. Um, and I just love that time period. I love the clothes, the cars, the, the I don't smoke, but the cigarettes, everything about that period. Um, and that's where the Archer series came from. And, and you know, you've been writing for a long time as well. One way to keep yourself motivated as a storyteller is to create different scenarios for yourself to explore as a writer. You know, you go different time periods, different characters, create a new series, and then you're not writing the same book over and over again. You really have to expand your horizons. Well, well you did it beautifully, and reading the book made me want to uh, take a ride in a convertible and get a hip flask. Um, it was, it's, it's really uh, such fun. And, and the couple at the heart of it, uh, Liberty Callahan and Archer, um, are so winning. Uh, and, and, and one thing that I loved about the book is they meet at the beginning of the book. And all through the book, as other things are happening very quickly, as people are getting killed, falling into bed, mysteries are being solved, their story is really a very slow, almost old-fashioned courtship as two people who've been hurt and are trying to rediscover their lives circle each other and learn to trust each other. And I thought that was really beautiful. It must have been fun to write. Uh, it was. I mean, when you're writing a mystery or a thriller, that I call it, you know, half of the book is sort of devoted to the high stakes, the action, the, the crime, the violence. 
And the other part I sort of call sort of the domestic side of any type of story like that, where you have to get into the characters and the people. You know, they're not always going to be running around shooting people and, and having car chases and stuff. They have to come to know each other. And so when they started out in, in, um, in Reno, you know, they both had dreams. She wanted to be an actress. He wanted to be a gumshoe. They headed west following their dreams. They were scared. They were unsure of themselves. They didn't know if they were going to be able to make it or not, but they were together. And I wanted them to be, you know, I wanted them to be equals. I wanted them, I didn't want her to be his sidekick. Um, and when they got out to California, they each sort of pursued their dreams. And throughout the entire book, they continually sort of went back to one another as kind of a touchstone. You know, all this, all those dramatic things were happening. They were sort of the guideposts for each other. Um, and I think that really adds a lot to any, any book. Um, because look, everybody can relate to the action. The action is fun. You know, people die, crimes are committed, mysteries are solved, twists and turns. That's terrific stuff. But at the end of the day, you have to have an emotional connection to the story. And that, and the emotional connection in this story was, you know, Aloysius Archer and Liberty Callahan. And people could go back and say, yeah, they're real people. I could get, I sort of get them. I understand where they're coming from. Uh, so that was really cool for me. I, you know, two things about your protagonist, your FBI agent, Tom Smith that I wanted to explore with you that I found fascinating. Um, one, he's not your typical, you know, hero sort of guy. You know, he's a young guy, he's just starting out his career. His old man was a legendary FBI agent, take no prisoners, you know, do what you have to do. Um, he just in your face kind of guy, uh, which a lot of FBI agents are like that. And, you know, we first meet him in a bar and he meets his dad and, he, and his, they haven't seen each other. They're obviously estranged. Um, and it's a, it's a really compelling scene and you, it's only a few pages long, but you convey pretty much everything that's happened in their relationship over, you know, Tom Smith's lifetime. Uh, so that's sort of the first point and sort of how, you know, why you thought that relationship and showing it. And we won't talk about, you know, I don't want to give away what happens to either of the characters shortly thereafter, but. Um, that relationship and how it sort of fleshed out Tom Smith's character. And then secondly, and we talked about, I talked about this before, you sort of turn, you know, the FBI doesn't use the term profiler, but let's just say profiler. Um, you turn the profiling system the FBI uses on its head in this novel. You know, you knocked away all the underpinnings and went way in, into it in a very different and unique way. And I'd like you to sort of talk about, you know, how you did that and why you decided to do it that way. Let me start off with the father-son relationship and with Tom Smith. Um, I had an absolutely lovely father. Uh, and for some reason, a lot of my books, especially my young adult books, they have these fraught father-son relationships. And my readers say, oh, my God, what was your relationship with like with your father? Um, <laughs> it was actually really, really good. And, and, and they, were, they were both really sweet parents. Um, but... You know, when I started writing this book, I only had the character of Green Man. Uh, and, and I knew that it was going to be a book about kind of an echo terrorist uh, who was going to be committing one or two or three attacks. Uh, but I didn't know actually how to sustain the novel. And, and, and in that second chapter, the character of Tom Smith came to me and kind of wrote himself into that scene. And all of a sudden, I, 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 and I know you are like me, you don't always plan out the novel. It just sort of takes over. And all of a sudden, when I had those two characters who are kind of flip sides of each other, uh, Green Man uh, could almost be Tom's father. Uh, but anyway, when I had Tom, I was able to write the novel. Um, and, and very much in my mind, when I came up with Tom's character, were, were two of my favorite writers, you know, William Goldman's Marathon Man, uh, uh, and the main character, Babe, uh, who's a Columbia graduate student in history, uh, and Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy by John Le Carre, kind of my idol, um, and 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 his main character, George Smiley, and and George Smiley and Babe seem to have absolutely nothing in common, but they're both really smart nerds, uh, and 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 they sort of are in action books, and yet they they do a lot of interrogation scenes. And, and, and you sort of get caught up in them. And I had started reading Ian Fleming and, and James Bond, and that was my idea of an action hero. And all of a sudden that I realized that this kind of a smart nerd who has a unique way, a smart way, and you care about him, of going about tracking somebody down can be just as interesting. 
So that, that was really, you know, where Tom came from. And, and I thought the best way of showing that off, of establishing his whole character, was giving him one scene with his father. Uh, because in the rest of the book, he is trying to break away from his father's shadow. Uh, and as you say, that scene establishes it. And his central dilemma is he's the only person smart enough to catch Green Man, but should he do it? Should he possibly catch the one person who could save the world? And sort of forcing his hand is his father's, you know, uh, the, the shadow of his father, who was an iconic FBI agent and would always get his man. So that was sort of where that came from. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was it was absolutely terrific, and it really it fleshed out his character wonderfully. Um, you you give him quite the dilemma because you're right. He you know as he goes through, he has so much self doubt and he's torn. Um, part of him admires the man he's supposed to hunt down, and he continually throughout the novel has to sort of emphatically tell people who don't really know if he actually wants to catch this guy or not. Yes, he is a bad guy. I want to catch him. Um, I, you know, maybe I, I understand why he's doing it, but he's doing it in a way that's criminal and we have to bring him in because that's my job. That's what I signed up for. That's why that's the oath that I swore to uphold the laws of this country. So it was kind of a Hobson's choice. You know, it's, it's like he was, he's damned if he does and damned if he's going to walk away from this. You know, if he's going to, if he catches green man, he's going to be feel good and bad. And if he doesn't, he's going to feel good and bad. Um, that's just the way it is. It's not really a win-win for him, um, which I found absolutely fascinating, the way you structured it. And the structure of the novel, even though you and I are not outliners all the way through, the structure of the novel was fantastic. And uh, really, having read read the book, I, I don't think, I couldn't think of a more perfect way for you to have put the story together, because it, it provided the most delicious dilemmas, moral dilemmas for pretty much every character uh, in the novel. Oh. Now, you yeah. have... Can I jump in since you mentioned that? And yeah. could I jump in and ask you about a gambling man, which starts off for me as kind of a wonderful free road movie. Uh, they meet in uh, Reno and they get on the road. And for the first 50 pages, I'm falling in love with your two main characters. And then they make it to Baytown. And all of a sudden it becomes a small city mystery, very intricately plotted. And I, I know that you don't always write from outlines, but I've also written mysteries. And for me, they're the hardest kinds of stories to structure. And I was wondering in this particular case, given the mystery element, uh, did you in fact write it from an outline or did you at least know exactly where you were going? Or did you set up a very complicated situation? And since you've written so many great novels, did you just trust yourself that you'd be able to solve it? Yeah, it's pretty much the latter, uh, the latter really? point. Yes, um, you know it, when you're writing a novel like this, you it's kind of like you have a bunch of balls in the air, and you have a certain feel for where the story is going to go. And I always give this analogy that um, in writing a novel, you know, people who outline and people who don't outline, and there's some people who are sort of in the middle. Um, if you want to learn how to drive a Formula One race car, there are two ways to do it. You can read a book about driving a Formula One car, race car, or you can drive a Formula One race car, you know? And for me, I call it being in the trenches. Being in the trenches is that you're in the middle of the story, immersed in everything that's going on, the characters, the stories, the twists, the turns. Your, your brain is processing information in a million megabytes a second. Um, cause you're in the moment, things are exciting and things are moving and you have to make decisions. You know, you're in, in the pages, you have to decide where you want to go and what you want to do. It's almost like your brain is fine tuning itself because of the situation you're in. You can take a step back and do an outline where you're not under that pressure at all. You're not in the trenches. You're not actually writing the story. You're sort of outlining what you want it to be. There's not that pressure of, okay, I have to compose these sentences. They're going to have to count at some point. I'm not just doing a bullet point saying, you know, Archer has to do this at some point and Liberty Callahan is going to meet him at some point. And I'll think about the exact situation when I'm writing the novel. I like to sort of plot while I'm in the moment, because I think that's when I'm totally immersed in the story. And it's almost like your brain has become a supercomputer because you see everything clearly. Um, it's almost like a, you know, a running back in the NFL who can see the entire field or Tom Brady quarterback who could see everybody coming, every player on the field, he knows exactly where they are. 
and he knows exactly when he's supposed to throw the ball. And when the receivers, he's going to throw the ball to a spot, not to a receiver. And the receiver is going to catch the ball and you know maybe score a touchdown. That's the difference for me. I have to be in the moment, and that's when I, you know, the plot and the elements and the and everything comes together for me. I can't do it detached months before I sit down to write the novel in a detached way, sitting down plotting through an outline. You know, for me, that's just not being in the moment. So. Um, yeah, when I got to Baytown, it was a small town mystery. Yes, it had to be very intricate. And I knew that, you know, I sort of build this overlay on top of it. I kind of know where I want things to go. And then I will build in the more intricate layers as I'm going through the novel and going back through it again and editing and all that. Because I know the more that I do, the more that I know that I have to do, but the more that I, that I figure out answers to questions that I have as well. It's kind of a journey for me. It's so interesting because it's for me, it's much the same when I write novels, you know, and I, I do two kinds of writing. I've also done a lot of screenwriting for Hollywood and it's completely different. Uh, for me, a novel is really all about character. And if I catch the voice of the main character and I'm smart enough to stay out of his or her way and just let them tell their own story uh, and the best novels I've written, I have no idea how they're going to end. Uh, I just let the character take me and pe people talk about writer's block, but for me, writer's block is actually when you try to interfere with your characters and force them to do something they don't want to do. And, and what I do when I hit that is I just sort of back up to the point where the story was working and I just try to let the character show me the way that it should work. Um, whereas when I write for Hollywood, uh, screenplays for me are all about structured conflict. And so I usually end up writing a 12, 15, even 20 page single spaced outline. Uh, and, and part of the reason is because the studios and if you're working with a director or actors, they want to be collaborative. They want to see what it's going to look like. And, and there's, you know, you're building kind of the blueprint for a 50, 60, 70 million dollar movie. Everybody wants to see exactly what they're going to get. So, I mean, the good part of that is you can structure the conflict really carefully. But the bad part is the wonderful freedom that you have writing a novel, uh, unknow not knowing where it's going to lead, letting your character take you. Uh, I don't have that when I write for Hollywood. Yeah, I, I definitely find that fascinating. You write, you've written so many great films, and um, I've adapted one of my own novels for, for film, um, Wish You Well. It starred Ellen Burstyn and Josh Lucas. Um, and it's a collaboration. You know, when you're as a novelist, you're kind of the king or queen of the mountain. You write it and you send it in. People, you know, editors comment on it, but you're controlling the, the process of the writing. You created the story. It's not like you have to write pages and send it to somebody for approval and you get it back or the director is going to give you notes or the producer is going to give you notes. You have to rewrite stuff. And, you know, at some point they may get tired of you and fire you and hire somebody else. That's just the way the film world works. But in the novel world, you're sort of the master and commander. When I was when I was writing uh, Wish You Well, um, it, right in the middle of filming, Hurricane Sandy hit us, um, and we lost two days of shooting, and we lost a courtroom, you know, courthouse where we had uh, one day of shooting, and there was no way to get the courthouse back because it was it was actually functioning courthouse, and so they had cases they were hearing, and so I woke up one morning and realized we had a gap in the plot, you know, we had our our shot our shot schedule, and if I didn't come up with something new, then the story wasn't going to make sense. Um, and I remember I'm sitting out on a t wooden table in the middle of, of a farm farm in a field with roosters crawling all over my butt. And I'm writing a, a new page of dialogue for Ellen Burstyn, an Oscar winning actress who's in full costume waiting in front of the camera for me to deliver this line, you know, page of dialogue for her to memorize and then deliver. And I thought, one, this is probably the most pressure I've ever faced because <laughs> they're waiting for me to write this page of dialogue. And two, it was like most ex one of the most exhilarating moments of my life um, at the same time. It was just, I loved it and I hated it both at the same time. Um, I, I love being you know, in that part of the film process because you're working with so many talented people. And one thing that I learned from that experience that I think helped on my novel side was that when you have, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, I'm, I'm a wordsmith. I'm supposed to write this stuff. So I'm going to write all this dialogue and Ellen Burstyn is going to deliver it. And then as I'm writing it, I was like, Ellen Burstyn is a terrific actress, you know, wonderful. So why should I give her 10 lines of dialogue when I can give her one line of dialogue and then let her 
be Ellen Burstyn, you know, and just say the rest of it with an expression, you know, that says everything I could have said in 10 lines of dialogue. And that really helped me be more concise and succinct with my novel writing. Uh, well, since we're talking about dialogue, um, you know, I, I have spent a lot of time as a screenwriter kind of studying dialogue and the, dif the difference between dramatic and novelistic dialogue. Um, and I also teach at Columbia Film School, which is really one of the great pleasures of my life. And I find that the single hardest thing to teach is dialogue um, because you try your best, but the truth is some people are born with it. It's almost a gift from God. And, and if people don't have it, you can learn some things, but it's very, very hard. And uh, when I read Absolute Power years ago and uh, right through to last week when I read A Gambling Man, uh, I was so struck by your dialogue, which is so natural and character specific. But I think the word that I would really use is playful. Uh, your, your characters have such a good time talking to each other. And I kind of wondered where, if you knew where that came from, a lot of people I teach who are great with dialogue are playwrights or they've done sketch comedy. Uh, some of them tell me they read it out loud to their friends. And I was just wondering if, if you know where it comes from or if you have any technique because you're so, it's so much fun. You know, I, I remember when I was a kid, I read this really famous um, children's book called Harriet the Spy. And Harriet, you know, she w wanted to be a writer. She kept a journal. She's, she eavesdropped on all of her friends, you know, growing up. And finally here, you know, somebody, she lost her journal and everybody discovered it. And they, she was writing this stuff about everybody and everybody turned, hated her because of that. But I was sort of Harriet the Spy growing up. I just had this just innate, immense curiosity about people that I loved to watch them. I loved to listen to them, how they talked to each other, how they didn't talk to each other. Um, and it depended on the intimacy of the relationship. Then people talk in shorthand. You know, people finish each other's sentences because they know each other so well. It's very different when strangers first meet. They can be guarded and reserved. They don't want to give out too information, although sometimes people just blab out a lot of stuff. It depends on the character and what you want them to do. But I think a lot of a lot of my ability to write dialogue just comes from the fact that I just love listening and watching people. Um, and, and what I find it fascinating just to sit in a, you know, in a chair in a mall or pick a place. I, I, I go to Vegas sometimes. I don't like to gamble. I just go and sit in the chair and watch people and listen to them interact with each other. And it, for me, it's endlessly fascinating. And probably where, you know, some of my, my dialogue, you know, ability comes from is the fact that I've listened to so many different conversations. And in my mind, I sort of feel like, okay, they're talking this way because of X, Y, and Z, or they're talking this way because of ABC. And that's how people communicate. And, you know, I found that the best of friends have this shorthand exchange where they don't really even have to complete a full sentence um, or they can just have a look and it's, it's communicated what they want to talk about and their friend reciprocates in kind. And people don't talk in a connected way. They don't go A, B, C, D, E, F, J. They go A, 12, W, 16, Cyrillic alphabet. <laughs> you know, that's just how people talk to each other and communicate. It's a very complicated process. And I tell people, aspiring writers, I say, look, dialogue is critical. Everybody out there is a dialogue expert. They don't know that they are because they are because they talk to each other every day. They listen. So it's just almost innate. When they hear a wooden dialogue in a novel, it's almost like a screech. They just understand that it doesn't feel authentic. David, I, I, there, 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 uh, we have a little more time to talk, but I know that we have at least uh, three things in common. We're both named David and we both write thrillers. And uh, we're both lucky enough to have the best agent in the world, who I hope is listening tonight. Uh, his name is Aaron Priest. And uh, I, I'm really interested. I, I know that you were originally a lawyer, and I'm sure a really good one. Um, and at a certain point, uh, you decided to uh, write a, uh, a, a novel. And I'm, and I'm really curious how that happened and Aaron's role. And, and maybe if it's OK, I'll first uh, explain how I met Aaron and how I broke in. Um, so I was uh, 23 years old, 24 years old, and living in a small city in Japan called Atami, uh, teaching at the uh, public high school and helping to coach the baseball team. And I wrote my first novel, 
which was called The Atomy Dragons, about very autobiographical, about an American boy who's a baseball player, his mom dies, and the family brings him to Japan to heal, and he ends up playing with a Japanese baseball team. And I didn't have an agent, uh, but I'd been reading a lot of Hemingway and Fitzgerald, uh, and I knew that their publisher was Scribner's. So uh, I had a, a woman at the high school who was good at origami, wrapped the book up in a fancy box, and I sent it off to Scribner's. And a, a month later, I got a letter from them that they were buying the book. Um, so that's how I started out. And I came back to uh, New York, and Aaron Priest, uh, who at that time was already a, a, a famous agent and uh, represented Irma Bombeck and other very well-known writers, uh, somehow got hold of the book. And he called me into his office, and I was terribly nervous, just 25, and here was this major agent. And he said, you know, I represent uh, 20 or 30 writers, and a lot of them are successful. And the reason I decided to become an agent was to develop new talent. And I like the way you write. So let's work together. Maybe we'll do a lot of books and make a lot of money. Maybe we won't, but I'll always be there for you. And I said, where's the contract? And he held out his right hand, and he said, here's the contract. And uh, then I went out to Hollywood and I starved for seven years uh, out there. And Aaron would show up because one or another of his book clients had a big movie like Bridges of Madison County. And he would take me out to dinner. Uh, he would ask if he could make phone calls to advance my career. He would give me dating advice. Uh, I, I remember uh, I was driving a car without air conditioning and Aaron said, David, you're never going to get a nice girl to go on a date with you in Los Angeles unless you have air conditioning. But he was really always there for me. Uh, what a remarkable man and a remarkable agent. And the only other thing I would add, and then I'd love to hear your side of this, is when it came to Out of Time, I hadn't written a novel in five years. Uh, and I kind of thought I might not anymore. And Aaron came, uh, took me out to lunch. And he said, when are you going to write a new novel? It's been five years. When are you going to give me a new novel? And I said, you know, Aaron, my mother, uh, my dear mother got up to 19 published novels before she died. And I'm at 19. And out of, to honor her memory, I think I might stop at 19. And Aaron looked across the table at me and he said, I knew your mother. She would have wanted you to write 20. And that night I began writing out of time. So. Anyway, tell me your side of it. I'd love to hear. Well, and I can't tell you how often Aaron has talked to me about you, and uh, he obviously loves you very much. And um, I, I was incredibly fortunate um, to find Aaron Priest. I had written Absolute Power, my first novel. I'd been writing short stories and dabbled in screenplays and had a couple of options, and, but I wanted to write a novel. I spent three years writing Absolute Power. I knew I needed an agent. So I got a list of agents. I, I went to the bookstore. Whenever I heard about a first-time novelist hitting it big, and um, I would go to the bookstore, and I'd look at the acknowledgments. I figured they were going to thank their agent <laughs> in that novel. So Aaron was in one of those novels, and I got that name and six other names. And I actually got the name that I got from Aaron's agency was his then partner back then, Molly Friedrich. Um, so I sent the manuscript up, the entire manuscript, not sample chapters. I, you know, I just the whole book up, and I, a short query letter to Molly. And, um, and I sent it to six other agents and, um, I was hoping to hear back from one of them. You just, maybe one would write back and say, Hey, you know, pretty good. Why don't you write something else? And when you're done, send it up to me. That's, that was the best I was going to hope for. And I got, I got email or back then I got letters back from six of the seven, six of them wanted to represent me, wanted to talk to me and one agent passed. Um, and a funny story about that agent, years later, I met him at a book event somewhere and he walked over to me and he said, number one, congratulations on your success. Number two, you're the biggest effing mistake I ever made in my whole career. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's a very subjective business. Back then, if you didn't relate the material, you didn't relate the material. Don't worry about it. So anyway, I went up to New York and I went to all these agencies and I'm sitting down talking to the agents. All of them said, you know, yeah, we can sell this book. No problem. It's a great book. Love it. We can sell it. And then I got to Aaron and Aaron said, look, um, and I went to see Molly because Molly was the one I sent it up to. And Molly, I went into this agency and, and Molly met with me and she said, you know, I'm going to pass you off to another agent at the, at the firm. I don't think you have a problem with it. His name was on the door when you walked in. 
So apparently uh, Molly had given Aaron half the book when he was down in the Bahamas with his wife, Arlene, and he had flown back up to Westchester to get the other half from Molly and flown back down uh, and finished it and then flew back up because he knew I was coming up to meet with people. So it, what he told me that day is the reason that I selected him as an agent in, and he's been my agent ever since and now one of my closest friends. He was very blunt, as you know, he's just a blunt person, but he doesn't waste time and I respect that. He said, look, I can sell this book. Every other agent you met with today in New York can sell this book. You know, that's not the problem. He said, all I want to know is, is this the only book you're going to write? Because if this is the only book you're going to write, I really don't have any interest in representing you because I don't represent books. I represent careers. And I was like, this is the guy that I need because, as you know, publishing, writing, it's a, it's a gauntlet. It's a very difficult process. It's not just getting an agent to sell stuff to a publisher or a film company, whatever. It's somebody who's going to counsel you. Somebody who's going to advise you over the years about, is this a good decision? Is that not a good decision? How is the writing going? Let me read the pages. You know, how can I help you as, a, as an agent, as a professional? How can I help you as a friend? And I just, we have had that immediate connection and I have never looked back. I mean, he, he has been my rock for the last 27 years. And it, it is hands down the best decision I ever made. Well, he, he told me that I had to write a 20th book and I took him really seriously, you know. And it's interesting because I don't know for you, but in many cases for me, I can't pinpoint where a specific idea for a book came from. Um, but that night, I literally went home and I said, well, Aaron uh, has guilted me into it. I uh, said my mother would have wanted me to write 20. I'm going to have to. I had been writing for a long time in the YA, young adult space, which I know you also write in. And it's a space I really love. But I think I used every adolescent experience I ever had two or three times. And I just didn't have too much more to say in that space. And I had written thrillers in Hollywood and a couple of adult thrillers. So I thought that night, okay, I'll try to write an adult thriller, but what will I write about? And, and two threads came together in my mind that night. Um, it, it was very strange. Uh, one of them is that my daughter, who uh, is, uh, was 17 at the time and an uh, avid environmentalist, uh, dragged me to a uh, rally. Um, Greta Thunberg had sailed across the Atlantic and she was going to address the UN and they were having a rally on the east side. And she was there, but she was smart enough not to say anything. She saved her fire for the United Nations. Um, but young activist after young activist got up to talk and the adults were standing separately and then the international press was all gathered there because it was Greta's first sort of American appearance. And, and the young activists said all kinds of different things, but the underlying message was the same. And it was really directed at our generation. And it was, how dare you uh, destroy the earth and then you're gonna get old and die off and turn it over to us. You know, and that anger really kind of resonated, you know, with me. And I took it home that night as I was thinking, what book am I gonna write? That anger came back to me. And, and the other thread was years ago, I wrote a young adult book called California Blue um, about a, a teenage boy who discovers an endangered species of butterfly in a forest and his father is a logger. So the discovery sets him against his father and his town. And in researching that book, I contacted a radical environmental group that was sometimes breaking the law. And I asked them if I could sit in on their meetings and they vetted me to make sure I wasn't with the FBI and they allowed me to sit in on their meetings. And I was fascinated by them because they were thoughtful and some of them were gentle and they knew a lot about science. And yet I have a very strict moral compass and, and they were breaking the law. And, and, and it really sort of bothered me and mystified me and stayed with me for about 20 years. And that night, the rally that I had seen with my daughter and that environmental meeting that I had attended years ago kind of came together in my mind. And I wrote the first chapter of Out of Time, I Never Looked Back. 
Um, and I was wondering if it's the same way, if you always know what sparks a novel, for example, a gambling man, what sparked that story about offshore gambling, or if sometimes you don't even know. <clears throat> yeah, you know, some, sometimes it's just inspiration hits. I think, you know, people come up to me and say, you know, how many books do you think you're going to write? When are you going to run out of ideas? And I jokingly said, I was born with 43 ideas. I have two more. <laughs> you know, I've only got two wishes left and then I'm out of here. Goodbye. Um, but um, it's like you. you. You talked about the experience with your daughter and going to hear Greta speak. That was another experience and that filled up pots, information and knowledge pots that you had. And that's that's the creative well. You keep filling it up with different experiences and different information and knowledge. I love learning new things every day. I'm reading constantly as much as I can about so many different subject matters because I'm fascinated by it. But I also know that the more I know, the more I can write unique and original plots. You know, I can take disparate elements from different think pots and put them together into a novel. One thing that I, uh, I used to teach when I went back to my hometown where I went to high school, um, I would teach aspiring writers there. Back then I would hold a newspaper and I said, okay, everybody pick a story from the front page, go to the back page of the newspaper, pick a story from the back page, different story, and write a story combining those two stories together plausibly, you know, and that sort of forces you to sort of be creative to make that connection. But I think a lot of my stories come from just things that I've learned in my life, experiences that I've had, things that I find that are interesting. And you know, you know, writing a novel is a long, hard slog. You know, it's not like you're going to finish it in three days. It's not going to happen. So you better be motivated and inspired and passionate about what you're writing about. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to come back day after day after day and work on it. You're just not. You're going to run out of energy and enthusiasm. You're just going to, you know, stop. And it's never going to, it's never going to be completed. So I, really try to, try to make sure before I, I make a commitment to write the next novel that I'm actually really interested in the subject matter, that I, I, I care about it, that I have something that I want to say about it. You know, with with A Gambling Man, it was very much small town politics. This microcosm, it's easily translatable to a macrocosm. You know, the stuff that happens at the local level, it happens at the national and the global level, just in, in, a, in a way that affects a lot more people. But it's, it's the basic human components. People are greedy. People are corrupt. People will never have enough. They want more power every day. Um, so that always fascinated me, and that's an element of a gambling man. And the gambling obsession, too, you know, I hate gambling. You know, I just – I hate lottery. I wrote a book called The Winner where a guy figured out how to fix the United States National Lottery using basically chemistry so he could pick the winners but it was a very Faustian bargain. He would always go to like really poor people and say, you know what? Because poor people play the lottery. You know, you go to, you go to rich affluent areas. Nobody plays the lottery in those places. They don't need to. And I, and he would say to the people, you're poor. I can make you rich. All you have to do is play the game. I'm going to pick you as the winner. I can make you rich. It's illegal and wrong, but nobody has to know except you and me. Do you want to play the game or not? And so that sort of device is for me, is just a fascinating thing because even good people could look at that offer and go, if nobody's going to know, you know, how bad could it be? I could be rich. You know, I'll, I'll do good things with the money. I swear to God that I will. Right. But when you actually get rich, things sort of change on you. So I think you're absolutely right that, you know, you have to be committed to the material. Otherwise, you're just not going to make it through. And when you write about, oh, hold on. That's okay. If you want to do one more, hi. Um, we do have some crowd questions that we should uh, probably get to. But uh, David, if you wanted to ask one more thing quickly, that's no problem. I, I, I do. I, David, I wanted to ask because you've had such a long career um, in, in in writing for film, and so over over the, over the, you know the, your, the span of your career. Where do you think the principal changes have taken place in the t TV and film community? You know, way back when there were, you know, a certain number of studios, a certain number of channels, TV channels that you would write for. And now streaming has exploded. There's, you know, binge watching where you might have a limited series, you know, that has only eight, eight episodes and that's it. And you're done and off you go. It's no, no longer, you know, 24 episodes a year and you want to be on for 12 years and you want to go into residual heaven. So I'd like your take and see, you know, how the business has changed as you've seen it. Um, well, the biggest change is the one that you just alluded to. When I broke in, the most interesting work was being done in features. 
and everybody who could wanted to be writing features. The best actors were working in features. The best directors were working in features. Um, the big money was going into features. That that was sort of where everyone wanted to be. And in 2008, there was a Writers Guild strike that went on for a year. And for various reasons that we don't have time to go into, all of a sudden after that strike, the uh, feature market began to change and to decline. Uh, and it's never recovered. And as it declined, um, TV has advanced and taken up, you know, that that share of the market and more. So now everyone wants to be in TV and the most interesting work is going on in TV, which which makes it a pleasure for me to you know teach it at Columbia. Um, but th that's a tremendous reversal uh, of, of sort of the way things used to be in Hollywood. Um, and if I'm allowed to ask one last question before we move on, I was I was kind of curious. You mentioned that you're not a gambler, but you wrote a novel about gambling, and uh, there's such authority in your writing. For example, when you when you write about offshore gambling, or I've written a lot of action scenes, and I know how much research and work it takes, and your action scenes are so good. Um, I was wondering, uh, for me, you know, I, I I believe that if you don't get the small details right. You, if you don't do your research, you kind of lose your authority as a writer, and people just don't believe what you're writing. Um, so I, I writing sort of a lot of thrillers, writing a lot of sort of police uh, stories over the years, I've learned a lot, but I also uh, try to really do the research. And there's somebody I wanted to mention in Huntsville, Alabama, Ed Nicholas, who had a wonderful long career in law enforcement, and knows everything. And, and when I don't have something I don't know, I reach out to Ed or another expert. And I was wondering what you do if you have that kind of a consultant. I, you know, I, I become a journalist when I do my research. So I go out and talk to whoever I need to talk to, you know, uh, the DC police chief years ago when I wrote a, a book called True Blue, FBI agent, Secret Service, FBI. I went down to Fort Benning in Georgia and spent three days training with the Rangers. Got my ass kicked from one, one end of the base to the other. Parachute jumping, sniper right the range, getting rolled over a Humvee. Spent an hour on the you know functional Army functional fitness training. I had a master sergeant in front of me and a master sergeant behind me. If I didn't keep up, they were just going to run over top of me. Um, but in those places, you sit and just talk to people, you know, and you ask questions and you listen. listen. Listening is a dying art, but that's what I do when I go out and research. And I found that. The, act, the best action scenes are where, counterintuitively maybe, you slow everything down. Because look, if you're going to ask people to be in mortal combat and maybe some, one person is going to get killed, you have to give them the respect of the moment. So it's not it doesn't have to be a blur of movements. I want people to know what it feels like to get punched in the face and to lose a tooth or have a bone broken or be shot. Um, one of the best films I've ever seen that speaks just to that was in the early 1990s. And, I, and you can tell... It was a great film because I can remember it vividly to this day. It was called Unforgiven. It was Clint Eastwood. And he shot a guy in the belly. And they spent the entire day, he spent the entire day from a distance listening and watching and talking to the guy as he was dying. Um, and it wasn't bang, bang, goodbye, get on my horse and ride away. Um, and I remember that to this day because that scene paid its due. You're, 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 somebody's dying, give them respect of understanding exactly what that's about. So my action scenes, I try to, I try to slow things down. I try to give in, intimate details, but I also try to let people know this is pain and these people are feeling pain. And I want you to slow down a minute and understand what's going on. I don't want you to just blur over this and go on to the next scene because it has to, it has to sort of pay its due. And for me, the, the best action scenes do exactly that. Okay, we're all. <laughs> we're, re we're ready for crowd questions? Yes. All right. Um, so this one was from very early on when uh, David Class said that he had stayed up all night reading David Baldacci's book. We have a question of which, which book was that? Um, You're on the spot. It was 1996, and it was an unknown, an unknown thriller writer named David Baldacci who wrote a book called Absolute Power. And uh, literally from the first page, it absolutely gripped me. And 
uh, you know, at that point, David, you 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 were just you you were unknown. It was your first book. Yeah, I, I could just feel that I was in the hands of a master storyteller. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, this one you've both already mentioned some things, but I'm just going to pop it up here in case you want to add anything. Um, question for both of you: Can you tell us about the research you've done for your books and what kind of research you did and how it fits into your writing process? Anything you want to add? I know um, David Baldacci's already kind of answered that. David Class, you got anything? Um, well, one of the fun things about writing uh, for Hollywood is they used to actually send you to really cool places uh, to do the research. So, for example, I, I wrote a movie called Desperate Measures uh, starring Michael Keaton and Andy Garcia. It was from my own idea. And the bad guy played by Michael Keaton is in like the number one maximum security prison in California. And I had never been to a prison before, but they flew me up to a prison called Pelican Bay, where they have uh, an isolation ward. And they had the 100 most dangerous prisoners in California there in isolation. And they asked me if I wanted to walk down the aisle and see them. And first they made me uh, sign an agreement that if there was a prison revolt, uh, while I was there, they wouldn't negotiate for me. And then they put me in a flak jacket and I walked down that aisle and one by one they came to the bars. I believe Manson was there while I was there. And I, I just remember looking into their eyes and it was, you know, very useful in writing the screenplay, but terrifying. Uh, David, any experience? Uh... <laughs> I I went, when I was writing this book called True Blue, I spent a lot of time with a DC uh, police chief who was a female back then um, and just had an incredible life story behind her. But I, you know, lots of writers go on ride alongs with police officers. So I did that, but I also went on walk alongs. Uh, when you get out of the police cruiser, it's just you and another police officer. And we're going through some, you know, some fairly high crime areas in DC. It was just me and him and his street name was Peanut. And he would tell me that we would go through this like, courtyard area with these apartments and stuff and we walked by and he would like point over there murderer rapist armed robbery drug dealer just pointing out the guys that if we're walking by and he goes i went to, went to high school with most of them and he, i just did i just picked a different route in life than they did um and then we came up to this one place we were looking for a house where burglary ring might want to be operating out of and he wanted to know if they were like having stolen goods there so we were sneaking up this down this alley, and he said, look, the first rule of thumb in this area, when you go into an alley, you better know where this alley comes out because you really need to know that because they used to, they would call them villains in D.C. It's kind of a weird name, but the villains all know where these alleys come out, so the cops have to know too. And so we're walking through there, and all of a sudden we come by this fence, it's sort of an opaque fence, and something hits the fence so hard it knocks one of the boards off, and the board hits me in the head. So I sort of stagger back. And I look, and there's like the Hound of the Baskervilles is behind this fence. He's knocked one of the boards off. He's got his jaws on another board. He's trying to torque that board off, and he's going to be free. So I looked at Peanut, and I was like, what the hell did we do? And he was like, we run, man. So we're like all in butt down this alleyway. And I'm like, my God, you know, whose dog is that? And he goes, that's Psycho's dog. And I said, who's Psycho? He said, he's a double murderer. He's sent away for life, but he left his damn dog. You know, so in the novel, I had a character named Psycho because how could I not have a character named Psycho in that novel? Um, but sometimes the, you know, the, the research, the, the key for me about research is, you know, it's fun to do and you learn a lot. But you have to leave most of it out. You're not writing a textbook. Um, you have a sentence here, a line of dialogue here, a little bit of a paragraph here. But most of it has you just have to cut it. Um, and that's the, that's the ego of the writer. You know, it's kind of like, I don't want to write a flip book. A flip book is where somebody's done a lot of research. They don't want to integrate it. They don't want to leave most of it out. So they just stick it in one part of the book and the reader's reading and they, they run into this stuff and they go flip, 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 and they get past it and back to the story. Never want to write a flip book. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. One of the challenges for me with out of time was that I did a lot of research into things like fracking and, 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 the environmental issues, and, and I had to catch myself and say, "Stop! Don't be didactic. Don't try to teach. Don't don't be speechy. Let the story carry it." And and as you say, take a lot of that di uh, research that I did and just you know keep it back. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right, we're gonna do um, 
one more question. How do you approach revision for your novels? And why don't we start with you, David Class? How do I, how do I approach revision? Um, well, at first I kind of think that I get everything right. Uh, um, and, and so I really, I kind of have to check my ego. Um, uh, especially, you know, uh, um, without of time, I had a wonderful, wonderful editor named Lindsay Rose. Um, and, and yeah, and, and, and who, and, and she went through the book and made a lot of comments, some of which, you know, I was resistant to because you kind of love, uh, what you write in your first draft. Um, but I've been doing this long enough to know that, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not infallible. And when a very good editor reads it and makes comments, you know, I, I have to, as I say, check my ego and, and really consider it. Um, and, and, and I made a number of changes based on Lindsay's suggestions. And I can say now that almost all of them strengthen the novel. Um, but I will say this, if I don't agree with something, uh, either in a novel or even in a really big Hollywood screenplay. Um, and, and I've had cases where they're, you know, go movies or the movie is being shot. For example, I did the rewrite uh, of Gothica while it was being shot with Robert Downey and Halle Berry and a brilliant French director, Matthew Kasovitz. And, and if they wanted me to change something, uh, and they were all a lot more brilliant than I was, but I'm, I'm pretty stubborn. If I, if I don't think it's right, I'll, I'll try to leave it in. Uh, David? Yeah, I, well, shout out to Lindsay Rose, who you, you used to work with us back at Grand Central before you left. You, you've got a terrific person in Lindsay Rose. I can't, Lindsay, if you're listening, I love you. I'll always love you. Uh, congratulations on the new baby, by the way. He's adorable. And just best wishes for everything. But I'm much, I'm much like David that, an editor's job is we have the same goal. We want to make the book as good as it possibly can be. They bring another perspective. Sometimes in your writing, you get a sort of a tunnel vision of like, okay, this is perfect. This is everything I want the novel to be. And then all of a sudden you get an editorial letter that it's approaching from avenues and ways that you really never thought of. And at first you're kind of, you know, I'm kind of like with David. It's like, oh, you know, I'm, no, no, that's, but then as you get into it and you understand where they're coming from, you also have to keep in mind, they're a reader, just like, millions of readers out there are going to read the book. And you're like, okay, if this person is saying this and thinking this, then other people will too. So there, maybe there is an issue there that maybe I don't totally agree with. I won't make the exact change they want, but it might make you understand that a different part of the book that they didn't even think of needs to be addressed as well, because you're the master and commander here. You understand the novel better than anyone else. I'll give an example. Mitch Hoffman is my editor. We've been together for a long, long time. We've done probably, I don't know, 30 books together. And, and there's a, an element of trust there that's unbreakable. He's just, I, I love Mitch. And with A Gambling Man, I had a, had a twist that I'd sort of built into the novel, and I let it loose at the end. And, uh, and that was in the first draft. And Mitch came back, and he said, you don't need that. You know, it's really an appendage. Um, the way the novel ends is beautiful. This feels sort of kind of, kind of lame. It's just... You don't need it. And I really fought him for a, a long time. I was like, no, I, I, I took a long time and a lot of effort to set this up. This is a great twist. People are going to go, oh, my God, this is fantastic. And then a couple of months later, you know, I went through it again, and, and I, I thought, you know, he's exactly right. You know, that was my writer's ego getting in the way. I didn't need it, and the book was much better because of it. I, I tell people not every word you write is set in stone. You, if you don't, you don't have to agree with anything people say. All I tell people is respect their opinion and give it its due. And then if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But don't just discount it offhand without considering it because they're professionals as well. And their goal is the same as yours is to make the story as good as it possibly can be. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, not to completely do the worst pun imaginable, but we are now out of time. <laughs> but I'm ching. So we're going <laughs> to. We're going to wrap up for the evening. Um, thank you, gentlemen. This has been a treat. Um, I have said many times there's more information and a link to order the books in the comments. Um, congratulations on your books as always. And hopefully we'll get to chat again 
in the future. To those of you watching, um, thanks for tuning in and we hope to see you um, soon. All right, everyone, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, David. Everybody take care. Thank you very much. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye-bye.